Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 72, Revelation, the Sealed Servants of God. And in this episode, we're going to look at the first four verses of Revelation chapter 7. What, as I will explain in this episode, is actually an interlude in between the sixth and seventh seals that the Lamb opens. And we'll have a little bit of fun with this passage using the language that John uses and we'll work our way through the Old Testament and through parts of the New Testament and we'll even manage to talk about the mark of the beast which oftentimes gets a lot of discussion when people imagine what they think the book of Revelation is about or what some of the freaky parts are about and we'll so we'll use that discussion to help us make sense of the way I think John intends for us to understand what it means for us to be sealed as servants of our God. And so I'm very excited to get into this and I hope that you'll find it beneficial. So let's just jump right in. Now to begin this week's episode, allow me just to read the passage that I intend to talk about over the next 30 minutes or so and that is Revelation 7 verses 1 through 4. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now, as we jump into talking a little bit about what's going on in these several verses, it's important to remember as we begin that this entire chapter, all of chapter 7, is the answer to the question posed at the end of chapter 6, who can stand? Now, if we forget that, and we try to read and understand Revelation 7 just as an isolated unit, as many people have tried before, we will come up with all sorts of interpretations that have nothing to do with the book as a whole or with what John intends to communicate to us through what he's written here. And so what I want you to notice when you come to chapter 7 is that the Lamb has only opened the first six of the seven seals. He won't open the seventh seal until Revelation chapter 8. And so what this means then is that chapter 7 takes place during the time that the seven seals are being opened. The content found in this chapter belongs to the series of the seven seals. So it functions as a sort of an interlude, a a break in the action, or a heavenly perspective overlaying the chaos we see taking place on earth. And this sort of interlude isn't even the only one of its kind that we find in Revelation. Between the sixth and seventh trumpet as well, we find another interlude, another break in the action, a heavenly perspective overlaying the chaos we see taking place on earth. And we'll address that interlude in chapters 10 and 11, and we will see there that that, that, that interlude actually builds on what we see in the interlude in Revelation 7. So it's helpful for us to know what we're dealing with as we work our way through. And so Revelation 7 opens with language of the four corners of the earth and the four winds of the earth. Now, Jesus actually spoke about the four winds in Matthew 24. And so listen to his words. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So the four winds are oftentimes associated directly with heaven. For example, in Zechariah 2, we read, Up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. But, you know, just as in the Lord's Prayer, when we ask, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we see that what takes place in the heavens has direct bearing on what takes place on the earth. And we've looked at this and talked about this in previous episodes. So this is why in other passages throughout Scripture, one end of heaven to the other also applies to the way earth is spoken about. So for example, in Isaiah 41, 9, we read, You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners 
saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. So whereas in Matthew, Jesus speaks of one end of heaven to the other, Isaiah speaks of from the ends of the earth and from its farthest corners. Right. And so in Revelation 7, these four winds are in some sense spoken about as destructive. There, there's something from which people need protection. But remember, Revelation 7 is an interlude. The events being described here take place during the time that the seven seals are being opened. And so if we go back to Revelation 6, to the first four seals at least, we see that John isn't the first person to connect the four winds with the four horsemen. In fact, Zechariah himself, one of the prophets, did this long before John. Listen to Zechariah chapter 6 for the first five verses. Again, I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, Who are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. Now that's really interesting. And I, I didn't bring this up when we talked about the, the four horses and I wanted to connect it for you here. But according to Zechariah, these four colored horses, the same four colored horses we see in Revelation 6, by the way, are going out to the four winds of heaven. And so the four winds and the four horsemen are connected. And as we saw in episode 69, Revelation, Conquering and to Conquer, the conquest, bloodshed, famine, and death that have so infected our world are the result of the collision of kingdoms. And we saw in episode 70, in the opening of the fifth seal, that Christians throughout the ages have lost their lives in the midst of these kingdom collisions. They remained faithful to the Lamb who was slain and lost their lives just like He did. And they are eagerly awaiting the day when the Lord will avenge their blood on those who dwell on the earth. We saw then with the sixth seal, the Lord's response to those cries for help. And when the Lord comes to their rescue, those with allegiance to other kingdoms see his coming as the end of all things and as a threat to their very existence. They interpret his coming not as protection for his people, but rather his wrath toward those who are oppressing his people. And of course, they ask their question, who can stand in the face of this coming wrath of God, not really expecting an answer. But John gives those of us who are reading the book the answer to their question anyway. What will the coming of the Lord do for those who follow the Lamb and yet are mistreated by the kingdoms of this world in the process? Enter an interlude, a break in the action a heavenly perspective overlaying the chaos we see taking place on earth. And it all centers around God's protection of his servants. These four horsemen that we saw in the first six seals, these four winds that are being described for us now, are laying waste to all the earth under their false definitions of what conquering actually means. And referring to these destructive forces as the four winds is just another way to direct our attention to all of the earth. This is a global catastrophe. There are kingdoms of this world that are happening all over the, earth, the world. And so listen to Isaiah chapter 11. It says, In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, while you and I know that the earth is round and has no actual corners, the metaphor still holds. Four, then, four corners, the ends of the earth, is the number for the whole earth. So you've heard this already, although I didn't reference it here, but listen to the way John describes those for whom the lamb shed his blood in Revelation 5, 9. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. 
for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Did you catch it? It's a fourfold reference to all the peoples of the earth. John uses the word tribe, language, people, nation. He uses four different adjectives to describe the exact same group of people. In fact, he'll use this fourfold reference later on in chapter 7. We'll get to there in a couple of weeks. Again, in chapters 11, 13, and 14. It's a way of referring to all the nations. Those who still need to be reached on the earth. And yet, while Jesus has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, they have not all responded. They do not yet know fully what has been done for them. This, of course, is why the church is here. As lampstands, the church shines light on the one who laid down his life for the salvation of the world, so that the world might know his love for them, repent, and find salvation. But as we saw in the fifth seal, these witnesses, these lampstands, are losing their lives in the process. What will the Lord do? Well, according to Revelation 7, he will seal these servants of God on their foreheads. Now, in order for us to gain an idea of what it means that the servants of God are sealed on their foreheads, um, let's let's step back a little bit. We've, we've actually already um, seen something in the book that gives us a little bit of a clue as to what this is about. Uh, sealing or protecting, which is kind of captures the imagery here, um, protecting his people from destruction is actually similar to the way Jesus spoke to the Christians in Philadelphia in Revelation 3. Um, here's what he says to them. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. In other words, Jesus will seal these believers with his protection and care by writing his name on them. But like we saw in episode 61, Revelation, Pillars in the Temple, the episode where we specifically looked at Jesus' words to this church in Philadelphia, for Jesus to keep us from trial does not mean remove us from the reality of trial or prevent us from going through it. Rather, it means sustain us in the midst of trial, uphold us there. Now, the clearest reference to this idea is the Lord's presence with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace in Babylon in Daniel chapter 3. The Lord kept them, protected them, and guarded them by being in the trial with them. So, listen to what we read there. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. You see, in this passage, the Lord himself met Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire and sustained them and protected them from there. And so when Jesus tells the Christians in Philadelphia that he will keep them from the hour of trial, the hour of trial means simply that, a time when their faith will be tried. And the only way for one's faith to be tried and found to be genuine is when they actually go through the trial. This is why James tells us at the beginning of James, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And it's important to recognize, according to James, that this is a large part of what the Christian life is about, gaining us into maturity and being complete, not lacking in anything. James will go on to say that if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. And what I think James means is not just a general call to make wise decisions in this life, but rather to ask the Lord, how is it in your wisdom, God, that you intend for the trials that I'm currently going through right now to make me mature and complete? Because left to ourselves, oftentimes we see trials and we run away from them. We don't like what is in front of us. We don't like what we're being asked to walk through. And so we tend to avoid or even pray away the very things that the Lord intends to use in our lives to make us mature and complete. And so James encourages his listeners to ask the Lord for his wisdom to let you know how it is that these trials you're facing are supposed to make you mature. And so if this is what it means for Jesus to keep believers from the hours of trial, from the hour of trial rather, it's possible this is also what it means for him to seal them. And we have solid New Testament reasons for supposing this is exactly what John has in mind. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Or how about Ephesians 4 verse 30? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And so you see God's protection, God's sustaining grace in the lives of his servants is his very own presence with them in the fire, so to speak. And his very own presence is the person of the Holy Spirit by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, here's where things get interesting. According to Revelation 7, 3, the passage we're looking at in this episode, these servants of God are sealed on their foreheads. In other words, they're marked in some way as being protected by God. Now, here's what I find remarkable. In all the fantastical discussions I've heard through the years regarding the book of Revelation, one of the themes that gets lots of attention is the mark of the beast. And maybe you've heard some of the wild speculation as I have, oh, the mark, it's going to be a microchip that gets implanted in your hand, or it's going to be something that is wired into your mind and don't get vaccinations because you never know what's going to be twisted up inside your genes and it's going to mess you up from the inside. Several years ago, I I found this kind of humorous, although the the student of mine who shared this with me wasn't laughing. He thought it was serious, but a student of mine worked hard to convince me that monster energy drinks both symbolized and embodied the mark of the beast that John talks about in Revelation 13. So monster energy drinks have a logo and their logo, what appears to the untrained eye, to be the scratch marks of a monster's claws was really a Hebrew letter, the numerical value of which is the number six. It's repeated three times, which again, to the untrained eye, looks to us just like three claw marks from three nails. But for those who have eyes to see, according to this um, idea, put three of these marks together and what do you get? That's right, six, 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 the mark of the beast. Hence, those who consume monster energy drinks are in cahoots with the devil, whether they know it or not. Now, maybe you can tell by my tone that I do not think monster energy drinks are what John had in mind in Revelation with his Mark of the Beast language. And despite the fact that whether I think it or not, or the devil can deceive us in whatever ways he wants, that that the main reason why I don't think this is what John has in mind is because we are already given clues in the book of Revelation itself regarding what seals and marks most likely refer to. And strangely enough, 
the seal that the Lord protects his own people with gets far less attention than the mark that the beast protects his own people with. Now, why is that? One reason I suspect is that many people have already decided before they even get to the book of Revelation that this is all just futuristic, strange, and otherworldly visions that have no bearing to life as we now know it on earth. And so their only categories for interpreting what on earth a mark of the beast might be in reference to are wild speculations of things that don't yet exist in our world, like microchips implanted in people's hands. But listen to Revelation 13, the primary passage where this discussion centers. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, we'll have plenty to say about this mark of the beast as well as the number 666 when we come to chapter 13. But what I want you to see right now is simply that this mark, whatever it is, is received on people's foreheads. And then in the very next verse, we are told that the mark is the name of the beast. Now, hold these two thoughts firmly in your mind. One, a mark received on your forehead. And second, that mark being the name of the beast. Now listen to the opening verse of the very next chapter, Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, we know from Revelation 7 that the 144,000 are sealed on their foreheads. And we know from Revelation 3 that believers who conquer will have God's name written on them as well as Jesus' own name. It's interesting then, isn't it? That this is exactly what we have in Revelation 14. And it's given to us there in direct contrast to the mark of the beast described a few verses earlier. Why then are people so eager to equate the mark of the beast with a credit card or an energy drink or some other visible sign? Can you and I see the seal of the promised Holy Spirit? No, of course not. But we are sealed with him all the same, are we not? The point then isn't that the mark of the beast is something someone can accidentally slip into or unknowingly get caught up in or purchase a monster energy drink and drink it because they like sweet drinks that give them energy and are now um, you know, in cahoots with the devil. This is not like many people I used to hear who were genuinely afraid of whatever the mark of the beast might actually refer to. But nobody needs to fear. John isn't here to confuse us. He's here to reveal things to us. And so the name written on the forehead as a symbolic description of reality simply indicates, and I want you to hear me here, it simply indicates who has captured your thought life, who you are looking to for ultimate protection in this life, whose name most fully clarifies your identity for you, Allegiance to whose kingdom most shapes your life decisions, where your ultimate trust is found, which kingdom you believe truly offers the world life, who is really worthy of praise in this life, whose strength do you draw upon when you are weary, and whose definition of conquering do you believe truly brings peace to the world. You see, the answer to all of these questions centers entirely on God and his purposes for his servants. And you can look high and you can look low, but I doubt you'll find a better place in the Bible that clarifies this than the way Paul says it in 2 Timothy chapter 2. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knows 
those who are His. Let that sink in for just a moment. The Lord knows those who are His. He has called you. He has chosen you. He has sealed you. He has offered you the promise of His presence never to leave you nor to forsake you. And when chaos and trials and difficulties and bloodshed and famine and death and war are all around you in whatever form they take, He has promised through His Holy Spirit who has sealed you for the day of redemption to not only never leave you and forsake you, but He has promised to be with you in the fire, in the trial, so as to mature you, so as to grow you, so as to give you opportunities to see His faithfulness in new and transforming ways, ways that you could never see it happen if you did not find yourself right in the middle of it. Allow me just to end our time by looking at, at the book of Daniel. Um, right before the three men are thrown into the fiery furnace, I want you to listen to what they say to King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 3, it said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now the question we all might want to ask is simply this. Did the Lord deliver them out of the king's hand? Well, yes. But did the Lord prevent them from going into the fiery furnace that the king threatened to send them into if they did not obey? No, the Lord simply chose to meet them in a unique and powerful and transforming way in the midst of the fiery furnace so that they would know his faithfulness there and all the peoples of the earth would come to know his faithfulness there. And so the Lord is stepping in before the chaos happens in order to protect and to guard and to seal his servants because he has a calling for us. He has a calling on our lives that cannot be extinguished when the destruction comes. Now we'll see as we work our way through the rest of the book that it does not mean that life is easy. In fact, for believers in Jesus, despite being sealed and having the presence of the Lord with them, their lives are not made easier. In fact, they're oftentimes made more difficult. But we're not alone in the midst of that difficulty. And that is the thrust of what we're trying to grasp as we read about him sealing us for the day of redemption with his very presence. The one who walks with us, who meets us in the fire, who walks out of the fire with us, into a place of victory. That's the message of hope that believers need when chaos and destruction and panic are going on all around them all the time. And so that's all the time we're going to take for this week's episode of the podcast. Again, thank you so much for continuing to tune in. I'd love to hear any questions or comments you have. You can find me on Instagram at the Unbinding the Bible podcast. You can email me at unbindingthebible at gmail.com. As I've shared before, please leave me a rating or a review or both on whatever podcast app you choose to listen to these on. Thank you so much for those who are supporting me financially with a small gift, 99 cents or 4.99 or 9.99 a month. Several of you have chosen to do that. That's a huge encouragement. I would always welcome more of that so that I can continue to buy resources and, and some books and commentaries and continue to work my way through trying best to understand this and explain it in the clearest terms possible. So I'm very thankful for all of you, thankful for the fun we've been having and will continue to have. Have a great week.